fellow by the name of John Connerup preach. He's a missionary for 11 years. He's actually now the director of the Baptist Bible Fellowship for the last, um, I think, close to 20 years, their missions program. His parents were his parents were missionaries. His dad is 92 years old and um, still serving the Lord. But uh, his folks were in Ethiopia when the communists came into Ethiopia and took over the country and forced all the missionaries out. And uh, he... Uh, told quite some pretty interesting stories, mission stories, but uh, actually I'm inviting him to come and preach at our missions conference next year, and uh, really did a great job, and uh, really enjoyed his preaching, really, three really practical messages, and um, uh, really just touched my heart with some of the things that he said. But anyhow, today, Acts chapter 13, we continue in our mission series. Um, as we lead up to missions. And so we've talked about the biblical vision. We saw that God's a missionary God in our first lesson. And then I brought you the book of Acts where we talked about Paul's heavenly vision and he was not going to be disobedient to that vision. And uh, then I challenged you last week as a church to be praying, to have a praying vision for our missionaries. But today we want to talk about the local church vision because missions really is about the local church and getting missionaries out. We've always been a, a church that, and I believe it's biblical, we'll see that this morning, that has believed in missions being, missionaries being sent out of the local church. So let's read Acts chapter 13, 1 through 4 together, and then I'll have a short word of prayer and we'll get into our lesson. <clears throat> Did I turn this on? Is this on? Yeah. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which was, or which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. I'm just going to read another verse here. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to, actually, verse 6, when they had gone through the island unto Patphos, they found a certain sorcerer. I'm not going to get into all that, but the point of that was they just kept moving and preaching, moving and preaching. And uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll got, kind of get into this. Lord, thank you for this time to gather here this morning. Thank you for your goodness and for your mercy and grace. Speak to our hearts through your word and by you, Holy Spirit. Just draw each of us closer to you. Help us to see the pattern that's set forth in the book of Acts with regards to missions. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, look on your handout, if you would. Uh, scripture is clear that God desires all men to be saved, and Christ commissioned the local church to be the vehicle that carries the gospel into the world. The scriptures lay out a biblical pattern for reaching the nations. And when we consider the magnitude of the world's population, the command is staggering. What is there, somewhere I think today between 7 and 8 billion people? Does that sound right? I think there's over 7 billion people on the planet now. Uh, which is pretty incredible because I think when, if you're my age, when, you, when, when I was a child, I think it was like close to half of that. So the world population is just exploding. Um, Anyhow, yet God's word is clear that the salvation of souls is the very heartbeat of God. And just a couple of very familiar verses to us. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." Or John 3.16, of course, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. So here, before we get into this lesson, so we, we find that the church here is at Antioch. And uh, if you go back into chapter 11, just glance back to chapter 11, we find some of uh, how this church... Actually, you'd have to go back to chapter 7 of the book of Acts. That's when the church was persecuted and the church scattered. And uh, the church at that time was basically in Jerusalem. And they hadn't followed the scriptural mandate of being witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. They had been witnesses to Jerusalem, and the church there was growing, but it wasn't until persecution, and it scattered the church. And as a result of that scattering, the church in Antioch was founded. So pick it up, if you would, in chapter 11, in verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as uh, Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they came to Antioch spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Well, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was at Jerusalem, that they should send forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. So that kind of that's that's how the church there in Antioch is formed. And interesting too, that last verse I read said that um, uh, Barnabas uh, departed looking for Saul. So if I remember correctly, from the time Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. Uh, until the time we really have much of his life recorded for us in his missionary journeys, I believe there's about an 11-year period where Saul was kind of uh, preaching and growing in the Lord and learning about the things of God. And so, this, so from the time that he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to persecute Jews, until what we're reading now is about an 11-year period. It's kind of... God preparing Saul for what he was going to use him for. So Barnabas goes and he finds Saul and he brings Saul to the church in Antioch. And that's where we, we already read there in chapter number 13. But chapter 13 is where we see uh, really the pattern that missions is, is all about. So if you, now, if you flip the page, if you haven't done that on your handout, have you, ever, have you ever paused to question how can we complete an assignment of these proportions? Billions of people in our generation. Um, but, but Acts tells us about that and, and sending them out. The guest speaker at the conference showed a video of a group in Kenya. He was a missionary in Kenya for 11 years. So in that video, there were probably two or 300 African pastors at a conference. And um, they had gathered together there. And so, um, and they were, they were just being encouraged in the Lord. Uh, and he was trying to make the point that this has been the result of, like the Baptist Bible Fellowship, that organization started in like the 1950s. And 11 of our 41 missionaries go out through the Baptist Bible Fellowship. That's a, it's, a, it's a clearinghouse. We send one check to the BBFI every month and for 11, or actually $1,200 because we give the BBFI $100 a month for administrative costs. And then what they do is they support the missionaries. Um, they, they put the money in their account. When we send $100 to, uh, or $1,100 for the 11 missionaries, the missionaries get all the money, the extra $100 we give to help support 
um, the, like I just said, the administrative cost. They, we don't have to do that, we just do that uh, because that's a mission in itself. So um, with regards to the BBFI and what they do, so I was looking at those, mission, those African preachers and I was talking to some guys afterwards and I said, you realize that those two or between two and 300 preachers that were all there, they're a result of what began a little over 200 years ago that a man was called of God and he went to Africa and he preached the gospel in Africa. And then other men were called to go to Africa. And then other men were called to go to Africa. And so here it is, 2022, and these men who are preaching there are a result because what we're going to look at in the book of Acts happened. The American missionary movement started in the early 1800s. And the English missionary movement, maybe just a little bit before that. But that's a result. And churches have been planted and lives have been changed. And the pattern for that is really found in Acts chapter 13. So the first point of this lesson is the context of missions. So again in verse 1, now there were in the church that was at Antioch. The emphasis there is on the church, the local church. You know, in the Bible, in the New Testament, the word church is found, I think, about 120 times. About 115 out of the 120 times, it's referring to a local New Testament church. Um, actually, I just uh, glanced in, uh, at Nancy and I, our, our Nancy, our friend Bruce Patterson, who, who were my friend from up north, he just came back from the Philippines. And if you remember as a church about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago, we, we sent $1,500 to his church there to buy Bibles. And he just came back from a three week trip uh, where he preached all through the Philippines and Bibles were distributed. And in the Philippines, same thing. Missionaries went, now the Philippines, their Philippine pastors, or Philippines, Filipinos, that, that would be the correct way to put it. They're leaving the Philippines and they're going into the world as missionaries. So missionaries went, churches were established, they were saved, and now they're sending missionaries out all throughout the world to preach the gospel. Same thing, just like what I mentioned in, in Africa. But it starts with local churches. And, uh, and again, just quickly glance on your handout. These are just numerous examples in the New Testament uh, of the reference and referring to local churches. The church, which was in Jerusalem. Uh, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus. He called the elders of the church. These are local called out assemblies. This church in Centuria. The church, which is at Corinth. The church, which is in North Adams. Uh, that's what we are. We are the church. And we make up the church. And um, uh, so that's what's happening here. There's this church that's been founded in Antioch. So it's a local church and there's things happening here. But we, we, we find this too in the book of Acts, especially so. And we find actually in Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles and John's epistles, the importance of being a loving church and a caring church. Not only we, you and I, we all love one another, we care for one another, but we care, as we'll get into this, for the world around us and people around us who are lost and dying. And, um, you know, we have a little girl in Sunday school I picked up on the bus today that a week ago, she, she, she can be quite a handful. But I really have a burden for her. And, but we had to ask her not to come for a week. And now there's a conflict between her and another little girl. And I'm just praying, how we, Lord, how are we going to work this out so both of these little girls can come? Because um, this girl is, she need, well, every child, every person needs the Lord, amen? But, you know, I mentioned to you about a year and a half ago, this burden I had for this little boy, Isaiah, who comes now almost every Wednesday night with his two brothers and his little sister. And that was an answer to prayer. But this little girl, her name is McKenna. I've mentioned her before. You really need to pray for her. She comes from a difficult background. But she got on, 
tried to get on the bus last Wednesday, and I had to tell her, McKinney, you can't come. And she looked at me like, well, I didn't come on Sunday. I said, no, you can't come for a week, honey. And um, that kind of thing just breaks my heart when you, when you can't let a little girl come to church. But you can't have one disrupt all the others. She needs a lot of prayer. She needs, she needs to be prayed for that she'll behave when she's here. And um, we have two little twin girls that come, and they're only four years old, and they want to come to Sunday school. And um, but we can't have them come to Sunday school right now because. Um, we need some more people to work in the nursery. Because right now my wife is teaching Sunday school and watching the nursery for Sunday school. So uh, I, I had to tell them, that you can't, my, my wife can't do both. And I had to tell the mom, we have to wait for them to get into school. And they come every Wednesday and they went home. First, the first week I told them they could come and then I realized we're, we're just not prepared for that. And I had to tell the mom, the mom came and she said, oh, my girls are really sad. They, they said they'll sit and listen, and I told her that they're good kids, but anyhow, we live in such a community and in such a time where people, children need the Lord and um, trying to reach them and trying to touch their hearts and uh, see them get saved. My, my, my little friend Carter came this morning. He doesn't usually come to Sunday school. But uh, I think it was Danielle that told me, he's looking around and he's saying, how come everybody's dressed up? Because he only comes on Wednesday. How come everybody's dressed up this morning? So he starts tucking in his shirt, you know, and, and he comes with his Bible and, and all of that. And uh, I, he flagged me down. He doesn't normally come. You know, we're, We've told you we're, our bus ministry is much bigger on Wednesday than it is on Sunday. But he was right there and flagging me down this morning, wanting to come. And you get on the bus and, uh, you know, I got, a burden for, for, I got a burden for all of them. But that little boy and, and that little girl I just mentioned, I really, God's touched my heart with regards to them. But, you know, the, the church in Antioch, they had a, a loving spirit. They wanted to reach people. And, and when you think, there's enough turmoil in the world and dissension and hatred and unpleasantness that as, a, as I'm not just talking about this church, but any local church, we just need to love one another and to, to care for, for not only our membership. Uh, Ethan taught a bit of a lesson on that on Wednesday night um, with regards to, to loving the brethren and not only the brethren, but all those around us. And uh, whew, um, one of the things you see about the early church is they were, they were of one accord. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's got to be uniform and everybody's got to believe exactly the same thing, but there's got to be unity. And uh, that was, we find that in the church in Antioch. And, and I find this too, this church, notice what it says in verse number one. It talks about Barnabas and... and um, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius, Menaean. And you notice it has, it says, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, that word in the Latin, he was, he was probably a black man. And because um, that's the word Niger means black in Latin. Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, which had been brought up with, these are all people from different backgrounds. Barnabas is from Cyprus. Um, I already mentioned Simeon here and uh, Lucius. He's from another. He's from North Africa. Menaean, if he was brought up with um, Herod, he would have had a Roman influence in, on, in his life. And of course, you have Saul from a Pharisaical background. So these were people from all different backgrounds, and yet they were all blending together. 
And that is really one of the beautiful things about, and should be, about a local New Testament church. Amen? That people come from all different backgrounds. Some are more educated, some are less educated. Some are this and some are that. And some, it's all level at the foot of the cross. It's all level there. And uh, this was a church that cared. And uh, we need to be a church that always cares. And so out of this church, you see the calling of missionaries. And so they're all together. And um, in verse 2, it says, They ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So Barnabas has retrieved Saul. He's got him in this church there. They're in that church. They're teaching and preaching and, and fellowshipping. And now it's time. The Holy Spirit, as they... As they're all ministering, the Holy Spirit calls Paul to leave and to go and preach the gospel. And it still works that way today. That the people are in local churches, uh, they sit under the preaching of God's word, and God calls them. He calls them to different countries, to different places. Uh, they sit in a missions conference, and the Holy Spirit uses that conference to call them. Uh, to call them to be preachers or whatever. Uh, but the calling... So the two factors here with regards to the calling of missionaries. First, this church, we learn as we read this, this is a, this is a sanctified church. What I mean by that, it wasn't a church just going through the motions. They were all engaged. They were ministering. And uh, God forbid that we should ever get to the point where we're just kind of showing up and going through all of the motions. There's churches like that. Um, one of the reasons we have a missions conference every year is to re-emphasize and refocus our hearts, keep that tenderness in our hearts about getting the gospel out to others. Um, we don't do it because, well, it's that time of the year we need to have a missions conference again. No, no, no. No, the point is so we can sit and hear these missionaries and what they're doing and God will touch our hearts. Because you see, I believe that God calls all of us to missions. He just calls some of us to go and some of us to send. I just believe that's the plan of God. This church, they were all in. They were all involved here. And uh, they were a church not going through the motions. Peter says, you also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. You're a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And um, that's what we are. We're a holy priesthood. And uh, you notice he said to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And I did a whole lesson last Sunday on the importance of prayer and missions as part of our spiritual sacrifices. We sacrifice, if you want to call it sacrifice, but we give our time to pray uh, for our missionaries. But they not only were separated, uh, not only did they separate Paul and Barnabas for the missions, they, they were a separated church. They understood that their plan and their purpose. And they were a sacrificial church. They being, they, in verse uh, 2 it says, they Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. You know, sometimes in a local church, some of the most important people in that church are called to missions and they have to leave. Like Paul, I'm sure, and Barnabas, were, they were probably core to the team that was in Antioch. But now God's going to take that core, part of that core, and he's going to remove them, and they're going to move on. You know, most missionaries, I heard this many, many years ago, it was a challenge to people who thought they were called to missions. And it was basically, listen, if you think you're called to missions, if you're not doing it here, you're certainly not going to do it when you get there. You know, what he, you know what he meant by that? What do you mean by that? If you're not doing it here, you're not going to do it there. What do you mean? Huh? Go ahead, Kathy. That would be one thing, sharing the gospel here. If you're not sharing the gospel with people here, what makes you think you're going to go to wherever, Germany, and share the gospel there? Well, what else? Yes. Yeah, like what? Well, what'd you do this morning? Uh, folded yeah, you fold, folded bulletins. Now, some of you might, well, that's just a, 
You know, what kind? Well, it's one less job I have to do because that's what I normally do. So, so, don't ever, so don't think, by the way, Mike, this morning, I didn't do anything. I just folded some paper. Those are little things that serve the Lord in a local church. The more people who do those things, what else? Yes, Jim. Learning how to clean up, pick up things. And, or like, I wish I had gone in the area and I have a typhoon come through and I have to help people in there clean up their lives. Right, so like if you have a work party at church, if you're not going to be part of the work party here, you're not going to be part of the cleanup process there when a typhoon hits. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. That's really good. What else? You can serve in the ministry in the church, and it's good, and it's important. Serving the community around the church is also quite important. Sure. You know, especially if you're a missionary, because if you can't serve the community at your local church, if your mission is to go to another country and plant a church, how are you going to Right. That's a good point, too, because when I was in Belarus, the missionaries could only stay in the country if they were also involved in humanitarian work. So once a week, they had to hand out clothing, medicine, food, help that way. Yes. Anybody else? Anything else? So sometimes, you know, these are really good because sometimes we, you know, the first thing people would think of is, well, teach a Sunday school class or sing and these are these are all good things but the other things that you've all mentioned are smaller things somebody have their hand up here taking just as we're discipled by the pastors here taking time to be sensitive to helping one our other church members to get closer to god to be more in the walk of god even with small practical things getting car rides things like that to get them to church but even but other things too, the prayer life, just being sensitive to what people need spiritually. All right. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Uh, these are all small things, but it's like the body of, uh, of believers. We add them all up, and they benefit, uh, and they go towards the Lord. All right. Uh, you know, the last several weeks, not every week, but one of the guys has been picking up all the orange cones and the two signs out front. And um, you might think, well, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal for me because I, sometimes, you know when you, when you have a home and you go home and you look around, you th there's things that need to get done. Well, let me just encourage you, think of the church as your second home and just look around for things that you can do. Don't always expect the pastor to do it. And just to pick up four orange cones and the two signs and put them on the porch. That was a tremendous encouragement to me that somebody would actually just see this and just do it. So look around for things to do. Um, Pastor Ainsworth taught a little lesson. I never forgot it. He said, you know, look around. If there's a piece of paper on the floor, he said, pick it up and throw it out. And I've never forgot that little lesson. Um, it's amazing. People will walk by things and just expect other people to do it. It's all part of the church, and it's our, it's the Lord's church, amen? But it's our church. When we painted downstairs, I was thankful that I uh, just put a word out and had quite a few people came and helped me paint. And uh, they really turned a, what probably would have taken me three days into a day and a half job. So um, that's good, but that's, but we're getting back to missions here. So a church, somebody's called out of a church, if they're not going to put it in the time here, they're not going to do it on the mission field. But there's a, the sacri sacrificial aspect of that. Our bodies, as it says on the handout, we're to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord. That means you've got to give your time and your talents and your treasures. You've got to sacrifice some of that. That's what's acceptable unto God. And um, yeah. I, I, I had forgotten, I didn't get, I didn't, they had a, a, up at Grace Christian School, they had a pastor appreciation day, and I was going, and then I wasn't going, and then I was going, and then I forgot, and then I had made plans, but
but I got a video from um, either Danielle or Micah sent me the video of some of our kids and they, they got up in front and they thanked me uh, in absence for volunteering my time on Saturday mornings and going out <laughs> and, and doing the bus. I laughed. I said, well, I don't really think of it as volunteering my time. That's part of what I do, but it was very nice, you know, that they, that they did that and that they recognize that. Um, but all it takes time. And Paul, Paul here had spent 11 years pretty much as an unknown, um, growing in the Lord and the things of God, and now he's going to go forth and God's going to use him. He's been called. And the church there in Antioch is going to have a part of that. And so it gets us to the last point here, the commencement of missions. How did they get it done? Well, in verse 3 it says, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So a couple of things here. I'm not going to spend time in the praying church because we did that whole lesson last week. But the emphasis is they were a praying church. And we need to be a praying church. But they were a participating church. And that's the point of some of what we've just said. The word they there, the word they embodies the church. It wasn't a board or some denominational organization or a parachurch organization. It was the local church. They were all involved. They said, we need to get people, we need, we, the Holy Ghost moved on their hearts and said, these men, they need to go. They need to go start planting churches and that's what they did. Um, verse 15 of the book of Acts, it says this on your hand, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. And, and I put the, the, in dark, us being assembled. In other words, the church, they were all together with regards to this. It was all part of it. Um, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, it took them a while, but finally the local church is now sending them out to preach the gospel. And because we're running out of time, they were, they were passionate about it. And the Lord tells us to be passionate about it. On your handout, Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where neither thieves do break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we see here in Antioch, they were, they were a giving church. They sent them out. I'm sure they, they sent them out and prepared them financially. So they were not only a giving church, but they were investing, an investing church. They were investing in the lives of people. Um, they mentioned the bus that we run. So it costs money to run a bus. In fact, I panicked the other day. And I couldn't find the insurance card for the bus. And I, oh, I thought, maybe, we're, maybe the bus isn't insured. So I called the insurance company to make sure that the, the bus was insured. And, and I had, I guess I'm getting old. I had forgot that, you know, we used to pay it monthly. But the last couple of years, as soon as the bill comes, I just pay the whole insurance bill so that it can't ever lap, uh, lapse. Oh, no, you're insured. And then I said, well, where's the card? I, I had found the insurance card and put it in the bus. But it costs money. And uh, where your heart is, uh, there, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So they, they, they were giving church, they were investing church, but we glorify God that way. Um, missions is Christ's direct, directive, um, his great to commission to the local church. So... Here they are. There's the pattern. It's a local church. There's important people in the church that were teaching. Paul and Barnabas were two of them. But we're going to separate them and we're going to have them go. And um, so the church as a body, they fasted, they prayed, they laid hands on them. And they, they, the church, sent them away. If you look on the missions letters in the back, you will see at the bottom of the letter, on most of the letters, you will see on one side, it'll say the sending church, the church that those missionaries are out of, or it'll say the supporting church. And then on the other side, if they're going through like a, the Baptist Bible Fellowship or Baptist World Missions or one of these other agencies that operate the same way, you'll also see that. 
But all the missionaries that we support, all of them have been sent out by a local New Testament church. And one of the reasons for that is, is because just like if you read through the book of Acts, I've been reading through Acts chapter 13 to the end of Acts about three or four times in the last week and a half. Paul will return and Paul will give a report of what's happened on these missionary journeys. Just as the missionaries that are coming this week, next weekend, they'll, they'll come and they'll give a report. The Thorntons will give a report. This is what we've been doing in, in um, Argentina and uh, the other missionaries as well. Bob Duet. this is what's going on in Myanmar and uh, so on and so forth. The letters are there for you to read. Let me, let me just challenge you. Let me kind of step on your toes a little bit. When, uh, with the exception, of course, we put a letter, try to put a letter in every one of the bulletins. But when was the last time you stopped at the missions boards in the back and read one of the letters? I did see about two, a week and a half ago, I noticed one of our ladies was there and she was reading the letters. Well, that was an encouragement to me. And I've seen other people do that. But what about you? Do you just walk past them each day or each Sunday? Do you take a moment and read? What's going on in Bolivia? What's happening in um, some of our other missionaries? What's happening in, in New Zealand? What's happening in England? What's happening in uh, Peru? What's happening? They're there to tell you what's happening. But I guess... If you don't pray for the missionaries and you don't give to missions, I guess you really just aren't interested. Ouch. I mean, if you don't have any investment in it, I guess why would you stop and read a missionary letter? Ooh. Right? <laughs> I'm kind of hard on you there. Listen. We must go, we must send, and we must depend upon the Lord to make it happen. And I just challenge you, I, I, I love to preach about missions because I really believe missions, it's the heartbeat. It is the heartbeat of the gospel, seeing people get saved. Let me tell you about this last story that I heard about what happened in Ethiopia. When the communists came into Ethiopia, they rounded up all the Ethiopian pastors. They tied Bibles all around their necks. And then they dug holes in the ground. No, there's two examples. They tied Bibles all around their necks. Then they doused them with flammable liquids and they lit them all on fire to deter their people from following Christ. And then on another occasion, they dug pits in the ground and they buried the other pastors up to their necks. And then they just stampeded them as the people watched. When Paul writes here, these are people who hazarded their lives. There are people in the world who are hazarding their lives for what we do. Let's take an interest in what we do. Let me just challenge you. Let me challenge you. Let's pray. Lord, bless the morning worship service and just break our hearts, Lord, for a lost and dying world whether it's here in our own area, our own Jerusalem, but around the world, Lord, help us to, to just know there are people lost and dying and they're going to hell. And we just need to, to help us to be sensitive to that, Lord. So just cause us to think about this and what part. Help us, to be, help us to be praying for the missionaries and help us to be interested in what they're doing and not allow the life and all that goes along with it to deter us from being interested. And I do pray for those children downstairs who come on Wednesday and Sunday morning who get about two hours worth of spirituality every week. I pray, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you touch their hearts and so those boys and girls would come to know Jesus as their Savior and that you would have allowed us just to have a small part in it. Burden our hearts, Lord burden our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. 
Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.